Welcome, I'm the dentist. In our dent agenda, we will be continuing the first chapter, History Taking and Examination, Part 3. These are the points included in this chapter video series. And here is the detailed content. We will be continuing investigation in this video. Investigation The second part of investigation is related to the specific investigation, which means that it is related to the tooth diagnosis. We will be discussing vitality thermal tests, periapical tests, other tests, mobility of the tooth, and radiographic tests. Radiographs will be discussed in detail in an upcoming video. Before we start, a general rules that you should keep in mind. Always test the suspected tooth and its adjacent teeth, which we call control teeth, for comparison between the normal sensation and the sensation in the affected tooth. Whatever the response was for the control normal teeth, it is considered normal for that patient. Always dry or isolate the tooth from saliva and protect the surrounding soft tissues to avoid getting false negative or positive responses. Thermal tests can be completed on teeth with full coverage restoration and we will be explaining how. Metal restorations are conductive. Starting with vitality tests. The first test is the thermal vitality test. Keep in mind that these tests only test the integrity of the nerve supply of the tooth being investigated, not the blood supply. The laser Doppler flowmetry is the method used to evaluate the blood flow status in the teeth, and they also can be used to assess the pulpal vitality. We will be taking the electric bulb testing, cold test, and the application of heat. The first is the electric pulp test. It is performed using a monopolar device called electric pulp tester. It sends high frequency current flow through the tooth, which results in the activation of the sensation fibers, and the patient will have a tingling or zinging sensation in the tooth. The electric pulp test should always be used on a dry tooth. The soft tissues should be protected. A proofy paste or other types of lubricants can be used to act as a conductive medium. Also, you can let the patient have the control and hold the handle to activate the current flow. If a full coverage restoration is present, like zirconia or Emax crowns, a bridging technique can be used. You can use a fine tip explorer or file and contact the tooth from beneath the margin of the restoration in the cervical area. And the electric pulp tester probe tip will contact that metal instrument, so the current will flow through the metal probe and then to the tooth. Also keep in mind that some electric pulp testers have a micro thin tip that can be used directly to the tooth. Then the cold test. Keep in mind that it's an accurate test more accurate than the heat test. 
you can use endofrost or ethyl chloride and spray them on a cotton pellet or a q-tip or a wool and hold it against a dry tooth you hold it for 5 to 10 seconds and then keep in mind that the tooth should be dry as the isolation is not as critical as with the electric pulp test the tooth still have to be dry because the presence of the saliva in the body temperature can increase the temperature of the refrigerated spray and lead to a false negative response. Also, hold the sprayed cotton on the buccal surface of the tooth in the middle or cervical thirds. Application of heat. These tests are less commonly used because they are considered less accurate than the cold test and more likely to cause damage to the tooth or its surrounding soft tissues. In case you're going to apply the heat to the tooth, you can use a heated gutta percha or a heated metal instrument or rubber. Before you apply the heat to the tooth, always use a petroleum jelly and apply it first as an isolator to avoid extra damage to the tooth supply. When you're done with your test, you should interpret the results you're getting. In case of vital teeth, the response will be positive, which means that the patient will feel pain that does not last for long seconds. In case of hyperactive bulbs, the response or the pain will be prolonged than normal even after you remove the stimulus. Then you should differentiate if the pulp injury is reversible or irreversible. In case of reversible pulpitis, the pain will occur while the stimulus, usually cold or sweet stimulus, applied to the tooth. And then it will last for one to two seconds after the stimulus is removed and then it will disappear. So it is not quite prolonged. Unlike in irreversible pulpitis, where the pain can occur spontaneously without the presence of any stimulus, or it can linger after the stimulus is removed for several minutes, not seconds. And here, the stimulus could be heat, more likely than cold or sweet stimuli. In case of bulb necrosis, you will get a negative response, which means that the patient will feel no pain or other sensation. Then we will discuss the misleading responses that you can get. Firstly, the misleading responses that gives you a false positive, which means that the pain will be felt, but it does not necessarily mean that the tooth is vital. This is in case of multi-rooted teeth, where there are vital and non-vital bulb canals. The vital ones will cause the pain sensation, but it does not mean that the tooth is fully vital. Canals full of pus. Apprehensive or anxious patients because they are already feared. Inadequate tooth isolation. Contact with the metal restoration, which is highly conductive, or gingival tissues. In all of these cases, the patient will give you a positive response, which means feeling pain, but it's a false positive because in all of these conditions, 
that tooth is not necessarily vital and healthy. False negative responses means that the patient will experience no pain to the stimulus, but it does not mean that the, that the tooth is not vital. Like in case of damaged nerve supply but intact blood supply, the problem is in the nerve itself, not in the tooth. The tooth is vital and healthy. Secondary dentine. It has less tubules and decreased permeability. Large insulating restorations inside or around the tooth. Calcified or receded bulb chamber. Calcified canals. Recently traumatized teeth. Trauma will also cause your tooth to lose access to nutrients and blood flow resulting in numbness and loss of sensation. Immature Apex Secondly, periapical or PDL test. Periapical tests include percussion and palpation. They are not used for the vitality or of the tooth. They only indicate whether there is inflammation in the periapical tissues or not. Meaning that if the pulp is necrotic, we are not testing for vitality. We test if the inflammation or infection has already reached the PDL or not. Starting with percussion. And percussion means tapping gently. The percussion is an accurate and localized test due to the presence of proprioceptors. The proprioceptors are present only in the PDL, which makes their pain localized, unlike the pulp pain, which is unlocalized, and that's why in pulp test we use control adjacent teeth. The percussion test can be performed by tapping gently on the incisal or occlusal surface of the tooth and on the buccal surface of the tooth because it must be applied vertically and horizontally. If the patient experiences more sensitivity with the horizontal percussion than the vertical, it means that the problem might be predontal in origin. Palpation. Palpation is to test the periapical inflammation or infection. You apply a firm pressure with your finger to the mucosa overlying the root apex of the tooth, both in the facial or buccal surface and on the lingual or palatal surfaces as well. A positive response can be sensitivity, swelling over the area, bony expansion due to the inside infection, or a break in the cortical plate of bone. You always should test the contralateral site for comparison. Now we can discuss the other tests that can be used to test the bulb vitality. Drilling a cavity inside the dentine without using local anesthesia is an accurate diagnostic test, but keep in mind that you will be causing an irreversible destruction in the tooth tissue, and that's why you can use that only as a last resort. Also helpful in case of crowded teeth, because other tests can lead to sensitivity in all the adjacent teeth in case of crowding teeth. Biting on a tooth sleuth, a gauze or a rubber. This can be used to try and elicit pain due to cracked tooth, especially vertical root fracture. 
Local anesthesia can be used to localize the origin of the pain. If you infiltrate the nerve supply of the suspected tooth and then check if the pain will disappear or not. Tooth mobility. By this, we do not mean the normal physiologic movement. We mean the tooth movement in its socket resulting from applying a force. The tooth mobility could be due to periodontal disease, meaning that all the supporting tissues of the tooth are destructed, including PDL, gingiva, and bone. Apicolapsis. Fracture root or supporting bone. Mobility is graded clinically by applying a firm buccal lingual pressure using either two metal instrument handles or one metal instrument and a gloved finger on the other side. When you apply the pressure, you should move buccal lingually. The grades of tooth mobility are graded 1 to 3. 1 in case that it is more than the normal but less than 0.2 mm horizontal movement. Grade 2 is a moderate movement than the normal, ranging from 1 to 2 mm, also in the horizontal direction. Grade 3 means that the mobility is severe and more than 2 mm horizontal and the presence of any form of vertical movements. Also, there is another grading system called Miller's classification and the classes are 0, 1, 2 and 3. 0 indicates the normal physiologic movement of the tooth when you apply force. Class 1, less than 1 mm horizontal movement. And by horizontal we mean buccolingual or mesiodistal in case of the absence of the adjacent teeth or in case of spacing. Class 2 means equal to or more than 1 mm horizontally and class 3 more than 1 mm horizontal and any form of vertical mobility means epico-coronal direction. Thank you 